All right. Well, today we're going to continue in our uh, study in the book of Acts in this series called Leading with Conviction. And we're in uh, chapter 14. Uh, if you guys back there want to do the slide for me uh, for the scripture. Anybody? There we go. Thank you. Yeah, it's Acts uh, 14. And we're looking at verses 8 through 11. Uh, actually, we're going to be looking at the entire through uh, 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 verse 20, but I'll read verses 8 through 11. So if you have your Bible uh, out there in virtual land or here, um, you might want to follow along. Acts 14, verse 8. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and never had walked. He listened to Paul while he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him. And he saw that he had faith to be healed. And he called out, stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and he began to walk. Well, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycosian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. This is the Word of God for the people of God today. And everybody said? Amen. Praise God. Well, you know, uh, here in America, we have a reputation for being a people that love uh, celebrities. We have a tendency to um, put people up on pedestals. And um, they have an, a lot, many celebrities have a tendency to accept the adulation, which is really fine until all of a sudden it's not, right? All of a sudden, many times, those celebrities, people who are put up on pedestals like that, um, they will crash and they'll burn as uh, the expectations that are placed upon them and the expectations they put upon themselves begin to outstrip their actual ability uh, to perform. You'll find that they begin to, to really become shaky as they begin to believe their own press, that maybe somehow they are superhuman, that their talents and their energies are bottomless, that somehow they do operate on a different plane than everybody else, and that's when the breakdowns happen, that's when uh, the, the, the disillusion uh, begins, uh, that's when that downward spiral deepens. But it doesn't only happen with celebrities. I think that can happen with anyone who is in leadership. And that kind of means everybody, because all of us are leaders in one way or another, in one aspect of our lives or another. And we can feel the weight of that burden of leadership on us. We're students who are under tremendous pressure to succeed. Uh, we're parents who are in that time in our lives where we have a pressure to be many, many things to many, many people. Uh, we're working people who just want to stay on top of our careers. Well, because we are all of those things, and we have all of those burdens, and we do so many even more things than that, we all, I think, have to become the kinds of people who can learn to have a balance, who can lead and achieve while recognizing that we are at the same time weak, that we're fragile, that after all, we are all only human. I really think that Jesus wants us to know that. Jesus was fond of calling the people who followed him, who had faith in him, who were his followers, calling them his children. He said that one of the greatest things we receive through following him and through having faith in him is the right to call ourselves children of God. That means that we can come to God in our weakness, we can come to God with all the weakness and vulnerability of children. Jesus says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. God gives us permission to be with him, the child that we really are within, regardless of what kinds of of burdens we're carrying, responsibilities that we are trying to carry out, regardless of how tall we need to stand or the brave face that we need to put on for those 
who follow us, those who we are leading. Still, God invites us to come to him in all our weakness, in all our vulnerability, and let him hold us up, pick us up, and lead us on, always helping us to recall, because we're with him, always helping us to recall that after all, no matter what we're trying to do, we're only human. That really comes across in this passage that we're going to look at today. Now, you'll recall Paul and uh, Barnabas, their two followers of Jesus. Uh, And just to clear up any misconceptions at the beginning, Paul is actually Saul. Remember Saul, who was the guy who was the, 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 the persecutor of the church. He comes over to the way. He becomes a follower of Jesus. He changes his name to Paul. Well, Paul and Barnabas are in this city called Lystra. And there aren't a lot of Jewish people there, but there are plenty of Gentile people, people who are Greeks and Romans. And by this point in time, Paul believes that that is his particular mission, to bring the good news of Jesus, this Messiah, this Jewish Messiah, Savior, to people who had never paid that much attention to Jewish Saviors or Messiahs or anything like that, the Gentiles. The Gentiles, the Greeks, and the Romans. So they're in Lystra, and they start doing what they did best. They began to preach about Jesus. And the Scripture says that many people, Jews and Gentiles, came to to believe. But as Paul was speaking one day, he sees a man before him who had been lame from birth, who'd never been able to walk, and he saw that he had faith to be healed. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, what he saw, but we can speculate that maybe what he saw in this man's eyes was a desperate kind of desire to change. You know, we all have those moments where we feel like we want to change in our lives. And sometimes we think about it kind of hard, and sometimes, you know, we, we fantasize what it might be like, or we wish we could change, or how things might be able to be better if we were this way or that way. But oftentimes, the switch doesn't really flip. The switch that flips from an idle kind of wish or desire into a deep desire that causes us to surrender, to say to God, take my life. Say to God, change my life, and I will do whatever you ask me to do. Whatever you ask me to do. That's when that switch is flipped from an idle wish to a deep and abiding desire. And I think that that may be what Paul saw in this man's eyes. And seeing that, he just said, stand up and walk. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. And the crowd was just, just astounded. They were surprised. I, I, actually, I bet that the man who stood up and walked was surprised. But here's the thing. They're walking around now. This man is walking around. And all of the people there who are watching Paul do this, uh, they begin to shout. They begin to shout in their language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Get this. See, they've seen Paul and Barnabas do this thing that they have no explanation for. And like all of us, they try to fit it into their frame of reference. All they know are the many gods that they have. And listen, they don't have one god. It's not like us. They have many gods. They had gods for their families. They had gods for their towns. They had special gods for the harvest and for the rain. They had special gods even for emotions and and things that people did. So they're looking at this in a frame of reference. Look what's happening. One or two of the many gods that we have have shown up here on earth. And they begin to call Paul and uh, Barnabas by the name of two gods. Hermes, who was the god of oratory or speech. So they gave that, that, that god to Paul because he was the main speaker. And then they called Barnabas Zeus, probably because Lystra, that was the uh, patron god, Zeus was of Lystra. So they're saying, man, look at this, Zeus and, 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 and uh, 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 Hermes have come down to earth in human 
form. And they begin to worship them. Listen, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, he brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he wanted to sacrifice, offer sacrifices to Paul and to Barnabas. So they're lifting them up. They're putting them on this pedestal. They are idolizing them as gods right now. And that puts these guys in a very, very unique position. I mean, think about it. They could, they could accept that worship. They could accept that adulation. They could set up their own church right then and there with themselves as little gods, right? They could do all of that. They're in this, this unique position to make that kind of choice. But they don't do it. Scripture says that as they begin to see this happening, Paul and Barnabas, they tear their clothes. That means they become extremely upset and agitated. And they run out and they say to them, they say, they say men, why are you doing this? Stop. Why are you doing this? And they stop them because they're wise enough to know, number one, that if they were to pursue this idea of just being a god, you know, well, they'd be encouraging idolatry, and they're Jewish guys, and they know that that's a real sin. But also because they're wise enough to know that even if they played that game for a while, how long could they sustain that? How long could they bear the burden of worship? How long could they bear the burden of that kind of leadership? They say, stop, stop worshiping us. We're men. We're men just like you. We are human like you. They're wise enough to know that after all, they are only human. Now, we can make similar kinds of mistakes. We can, as leaders, accept unrealistic expectations put on ourselves. But more often than not, we can go the other way, where we begin to put unrealistic expectations on people and things and institutions that cannot bear the weight of worship. We begin to ask things from people and things and institutions to do things that only God can do. And we see this. We see this not only the way that we hold up celebrities and expect so much from them, but we also see it these days of the way we hold up scientists, right? And science, how often do we hear that these days? Or experts who put down all kinds of pronouncements on all kinds of subjects across the board, and then later on you find that they've kind of shifted those opinions as maybe new trends come in, or maybe new information comes in, or maybe political alliances shift, or maybe there's just a matter of self-interest there. These things happen that way. They, they can't sustain because they're only human. We do the same thing with institutions, I think, like, like colleges, universities. A lot of people begin to groom their little kids very early to get them into a certain kind of university on the expectation with the faith that because of that they will have a certain kind of success in life. But no, no institution can bear that kind of hope or faith or hold that up because they're only human. How often do you hear this one? Well, we put great expectations, especially when we're young, Great expectations on our spouses, on our friends, and others to make us happy, to kind of fill those voids in us that no human being can really completely fill. These are all things, institutions, people, that we expect to do things that only God can do. The fact is, only God can fill those needs. Only God can fill that need that we have to understand and to know that we're worthy just within ourselves. Only God can fill 
that need that we have to know that somebody out there loves us without condition. Only God can fill the need we have for real success, which if you ask anybody on their deathbed really boils down to being loved and being truly able to love in return. Only God can fill that need in us to make the big changes in our lives that we really need to make and to give us an assurance that we have a future beyond this life. Anything else can't sustain that kind of worship. When we put all those expectations on any person or anything, any institution, any ideology, any activity, it's not going to be able to bear the weight of that worship. And it is worship when we begin to put undue expectation and hope and faith in those things. Ultimately, it's only wise to worship God because only God is the only one who is not only human. Only God is not only human. Well, Paul and Barnabas, they try to get them to stop, stop worshiping them. And once they do, once they get them to settle down a little bit, they begin to point them to the only one who is worthy of worship. He says, we are only human, and then he points them to the only one who is not. He says, turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In other words, the God that maybe you haven't considered in the past, but he's the God who has known you forever. He says, this God has shown kindness by giving you rain and heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. He does all the things, all the things that no only human being can do. He said all these words, and this is just a word of warning. He said all of these things, and even then he had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to him. It's difficult sometimes. But listen, when we are putting our worship, wherever we decide to put our worship, or the way that we accept expectations in leadership, we want to do, make sure that we're doing those in the right order. We want to be putting worship where worship really belongs. And by that way, being able to, in weakness and in humility, accept those, the, the leadership that is put upon us. And that we're able to go to God in our weakness and let Him lift us up. When He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Remember, He's giving us permission to be with Him, the child that we really are within, and that He will then lift us up and enable us to lead better and to lead with confidence and lead with conviction because we're leading alongside the only one who is not only human. Well, next week, we are going to continue in the book of Acts. Uh, again, I won't be here, but Ms. Whitney will be preaching, and she's always great. She will be uh, looking at uh, chapter 15, where we begin to discover how all of these various people that are coming together into the way are going to need to learn to put faith first. Put faith first. But this week, let's just remember, no matter what responsibilities we have, what burdens that we really are carrying today, no matter how tall we need to stand and the brave face we need to put on, for those to who, who look to us for leadership, let's just remember, God is calling us to go to Him in our weakness. Let Him take up that burden with us so we can lead better and lead with confidence and lead with conviction. Amen? All right. So let's go ahead and we're going to pray today. Um,